So guys, now we are going to talk about what is use case selling all about. Use case selling. If I have to define this particular term, I would say it like this, that it's basically it involves finding out an unmet need of a customer, unmet need of a customer by telling a short story or by just a simple conversation, which actually gives the customer some sort of insight or invokes an emotional state of anxiety or aspiration inside the customer. So if you see this entire definition, guys, what I am doing is that I'm telling is that first thing is that you have to identify that unmet need. And how do you do that? By a conversation or by telling a small story. And once you do that, what happens is that it actually gives the customer a bit of insights. And it also invokes or it may also invoke an emotional state of anxiety and aspiration among the customer. So the use case selling as such sees or views the customer as a consumer or as a user rather than a buyer. Now I'm going to talk about the four pillars of use case selling. The four pillars of use case selling. And the first among them is need. I'm going to define these four pillars as nice. N-I-C-E. And the first among them is need. Now need can be a service need or an unservice need. Service need means the need which has already been fulfilled, which has already been met. An unservice need means it may be a known need or an unknown need, but it has not been met. Or even if it has been met, it has not been met, it has not been serviced properly. Now, the needs, the service needs, if I talk about, are those needs which have already been met. So you don't need to do much on that. But where can your product make a great impact? If you start focusing on the unservice needs part. Now, unservice needs, they can again be divided into three different categories. They are known needs, means you know that these are the needs and they have been met as well, but they have not been serviced well, means they have not been properly been met. So there are, you know, some bits and pieces of products all around you, which actually meet those needs, but they have not been met completely or satisfactorily. These are the first kind of unserviced needs. The second one are those needs which are known. So they are known needs, but you don't want it to be serviced because there's a resistance to change, like waking up at 5 a.m. in the morning. Everybody knows that it's desirable, it's good for your body, for your mind, for your health, but there's always a resistance to change. You, you, you don't want to wake up at five o'clock. You will always be lazy enough to do that. Means these are those needs which require you to come out of your comfort zone. It may also be a case that you don't have a complete information about that need itself. So what is the second kind of unserviced needs? Are those needs which are known. They are known needs, but it involves you to come out of your comfort zone. So there is a resistance to change over here. And that is why they are not being serviced or there's a lack of information about those particular needs. And the third type of unserviced needs are those needs which are unknown. So you don't know about these needs. So if you don't know about the needs, you know, it has not been serviced. It has not been met. Now, if I talk about, let us start from the very beginning. So we defined the unserviced needs into three different categories. The first category was a known need, which was met, but which was not met satisfactorily. In this, I will take an example of Ola and Uber. So there was always a need of public transport, which was there. Now, you had got buses, you have got some local trains, you have got some public transportation, which was there. And the need was public transport. But there was something which was missing, that is, home pick up and drop. You wanted that public transport to be there at your doorstep. You never wanted to go, you know, a little bit far ahead. The second thing is that you wanted that public transport at your disposal at any point of time. And that is where Ola and Uber came into the picture. So there was something which was satisfying these known needs. There's no needs of having public transport, but then it was not being serviced properly. And with and Ola and Uber actually capitalized on this, this particular thing. The second category which we talked about were no needs, but there was a resistance to change. And I already took an example on that. That is example waking up at five o'clock in the morning. It's a no need, but there's a resistance to change. There's a need to come out of your comfort zone. And many of us will not do that. Many of us will not service that particular need of, of us. The third category, 
is what we, we talked about where the unknown needs and obviously they have not been met. They have not been serviced. And there comes an example of Chromecast or Apple TV, let us suppose. You know, you always used to surf the things on your mobile, on your laptop. And you never thought that, you know, if that is that that if that could have been presented on or casted on your TV, it would have made life a little bit easier for you. Maybe if you're watching a movie, you know, it's always good if you can watch that movie on your television rather than on your small mobile screen. You were not aware about that need, but when Chromecast and Apple TV came to the picture, they capitalized on this unknown need. And then you suddenly realized, oh my God, this is going to make life so easy for me. And that is where the need arose. So it was an unknown need, but when Chromecast and Apple TV came to the picture, you realized that yes, this is a need. And that need was being serviced by Chromecast and Apple TV. So these are the three categories of needs, guys, which are unserviced needs. Right. And this, these are the needs. These are the three categories. Out of these three categories, you have to identify a particular need, which you can specify it to the customer while you're using use case selling. You don't have to focus on the service needs because they have already been met. They have already been serviced properly. So just to revise this entire thing, all the needs can be classified into two categories, serviced and unserviced. Service needs are those needs which are known and they have been met satisfactorily. And then there are unserviced needs, which are again divided into three categories, known needs, but they are not being serviced properly. They have not been met uh, satisfactorily. Known needs, but they have not been met because there's always a resistance to change. There's always a need to come out of a comfort zone. There's lack of information. And the third category is an unknown need. You don't know about this. So obviously they have not been serviced. So use case selling, uh, you know, emphasizes on identifying these unserviced needs and then pitching it to, the, to your customer. So the next part of your use case selling is the I. And I means insights. What do you mean by insights? So I'm going to tell you a small story. I, along with my wife, went to Sri Lanka. And a lot of tea manufacturing factories are there because a lot of tea farms are also there. And alongside those farms, there are factories as well. We had got no plans of buying any tea from there, any tea leaves from there. But once we went into the factory, the guide over there started talking about the entire process. And I started talking about those different varieties of tea of which we never had actually heard about. He started talking about white tea, black tea, etc. and etc. and etc. We had not heard about this. And plus, the guide kept on talking about the benefits of those teas. He kept on talking about how this particular variety of tea was not that processed. And so it is beneficial in these, these, these particular ways. And so on. He went on talking about the entire process of how the tea leaves are being manufactured. And then it goes to the market for selling. We had no intention of buying tea leaves. But once we went through this entire process of manufacturing, once we came to know about the different varieties of tea, which we're not aware of and how they are going to be beneficial for us, we ultimately decided on taking some amount of tea from there. Now here, what happened, guys, think about it, is that a particular guide of us or the person who was taking us to the entire manufacturing process gave us some insights, gave us some information which created an awe effect inside us. Oh, I was not knowing about this. Can I give it a try? And such insights are so very important while you're using use case selling a strategy. Where you give some insights to the customer and make him or her feel an unserviced need which was already there. And this is how insights actually help you. So if you're going for a sales call, if you're going to meet a client, you give some insights to the customer. You give some insights to the client. You have some insights which actually make him or her feel like this is something which I was not knowing about. And this is something which can add value, which can service one of my unserviced needs which was there. And that is how insights are so very important while we use the use case selling technique. Now, the third part inside this use case selling is the C part. And C is called conversations and short stories, guys. Conversations and short stories. Conversations. Now, while you are conversing, either you keep on making statements or you ask questions. Which one is better? See, you, you, you have to make some statements inside a conversation. There's no doubt in that. You cannot keep on asking questions. But how is asking question is such a better option, I'm going to tell you. 
if I say to you that the sky is blue, your answer is going to be yes. Right? This is the answer that you're going to give me. But if I tell you that what is the color of the sky, and you may come out with different answers maybe. You can tell it to be blue, you can tell it to be black, at night it's black. There are various times of the days when the color changes. So what happened is that while I asked you a question, it opened a lot of possibilities for me. Plus it also opened participation of yours. So by asking questions, what you do is that you open possibilities and you open participation. And that is why you start engaging your client in a better way. So try to find out what kind of a questions can you actually ask to the client the next time you're going for a client call. And once you do that, you make the client speak about all the possibilities which, is, which are there. Plus you also engage him or her into a participative conversation. This really helps. So asking questions is so very important while you're using use case selling. And that has to be part of your conversation. Now the other part of the same thing, conversations and short stories are short stories. Now, what are these short stories all about? One of the most famous personalities inside the field of sales and marketing, Seth Gordon, has told that people don't buy goods and services. What people buy are stories, relationships, and magic. So short stories play a very important role, but what kind of a short stories? What has to be the features of those short stories? A great short story is simple and experiential. So two terms. Simple and experiential. Simple means it should not involve a lot of technical jargons. It should be very much relevant to the user. The language should be completely understandable. So it should not involve a lot of technical jargon. It should be very much relevant to the user. And the language has to be very much understandable by everyone who is present in front of you if you're going for a client call. You can even use metaphors. Use of metaphors is considered to be very, very good while you're telling some short stories. Like if I have to say, that, you know, I have been doing, our company has been a champion in this particular thing for a very long time. I would rather say it, we are the Sachin Tendulkar for, for automation. We are the Sachin Tendulkar for automation of employee transportation. Means we have been doing it for a very long time, plus we are champions in that. And once you start using metaphors, make sure that it's very much relevant to the context, to the client, to the user, to whom you're actually talking to. And plus, the three things which we talked about while you're telling a short story is that it should not involve a lot of technical jargons. It should be very relevant to the user and the language has to be very much understandable. And the fourth one, the topping, is don't mind to use metaphors. It gives a lot of good, relevant context to the particular user who is just sitting in front of you. The second part is that the short story has to be experiential. Experiential means while you're telling a story, you may also use some visual element. Like, if you're giving a PPT, don't involve just the slides. Use some video elements as well. You may also use a little bit of contrast, like rich versus poor, villain versus hero. This makes sure that the short stories are experiential. So make it as diverse as possible. Use some visual elements, use some videos, use some contrast while you're telling that story. It really helps. Likewise, while you are narrating a story, I'm just going to take a very simple example. Ramayana, if you ask me, it's completely understood as some story where the good won over the bad. And people have a clear cut demarcation. This was good and this was bad. So once you start contrasting the things, the user, the client who is listening to your story has got a clear cut idea that this is good, this is bad. But if you start mitigating this line, this contrast, it may lead to a lot of confusion as well. The client may go on to understand something which you didn't mean at all. So to make the short stories experiential, make sure that you use a lot of visual elements, you use vi videos, and plus you also use contrast inside your stories. Example, rich versus poor, heroes versus villain, good versus bad, etc, and etc. This really helps. So with this, we studied, we, we now know about the third aspect of use case selling, and that is conversations and short stories. And we now know how to strike that right conversation and how to narrate a short story in the, in the most appropriate way possible. And now we're going to talk about the fourth important pillar of use case selling, and that is E. And E means emotions. If you remember the definition that we get for use case selling was that it should invoke an emotional state inside 
the particular client to whom you are actually talking to. Now, how do you do that? It's usually told that motion creates emotion. Like what happens inside a gym. Right, you started running, you start lifting weights, and then, you know, it's sort of emotion starts creating within you that you are now fit, you feel happy. But emotions also create motion. And it does happen, especially in case of use case selling. You invoke that emotional state inside a client, and there are far more chances that you will be able to sell your product and services better. Now, we're going to talk about a little bit about Aristotle. So Aristotle talked about three ways of persuasion. He actually talked about three ways of persuasion, and this is what we are going to talk about here. What are those three ways? The three ways are ethos, logos, and pathos. Interesting words, ethos, logos, and pathos. What do you do in ethos? What do you do in ethos? Here, you talk about the credibility of the speaker. Since this particular person is telling, so it has to be right. And that is where you see many of the good brands using cricketers, film stars as the brand ambassadors. Because what is the technique of persuasion they are using over here is the ethos. They basically are talking about the credibility of the speaker. They are basically taking the credibility of the speaker into account while persuading the customers to buy their product or services. The second one is logos. In case of logos, you actually talk, to, talk, talk about facts, figures. And on the basis of that, you actually persuade someone that yes, this is the way to go about. Likewise, if you are selling a software to a particular customer, you talk about the amount of cost savings that has resulted from using the software. And once you do that, you're basically doing, what you're doing is that you're presenting a facts figures to the, to the particular client. And what kind of a persuasion technique you're using? And that is called logos. The final one, the third one, which Aristotle talked about was pathos. Now, pathos is a, is a way of persuasion where you invoke the emotional state of the client or the customer or the user like anger, sympathy, etc. And in use case selling, we are going to talk about the third category, that is pathos. How can you invoke an emotional state in your customer, in your client? The emotion of gain and growth is known as aspiration, but the emotion of loss is known as anxiety. So the emotional state connected with gain and growth is known as aspiration, and the emotional state connected with loss is known as anxiety. And now, relating to this, we are going to study about prospect theory also known as the loss aversion theory. This theory tells that the loss value curve is far more steeper as compared to the gain value curve. So the loss value curve is far more steeper as compared to the gain value curve. Means, think about your own experiences. I'm going to tell you a small story. You lost $1,000 and you had a windfall gain of $1,000. Losing $1,000 will take away more satisfaction from you, will make you more anxious as compared to a windfall gain of $1,000. And this is so true. You know, a salary of XYG, if it comes to account, the satisfaction that we gain from there is lesser as compared to the loss of satisfaction that happens if that particular amount of money we lose or somebody, you know, steals away from, steals that money away from us. And this is what I mean once I say, that the loss value curve is a steeper as compared to the gain value curve. And that is one of the reasons, guys, why many of the sales campaign which you see focuses on losing out on something if you don't buy this product or services. I'm not going to name specific companies here, but it's true in a lot of sales campaign which goes around you. Why? It's because of the prospect theories, because of the loss aversion theory. So if the amount of satisfaction that we are losing out is more as compared to the satisfaction that we get by gaining the same amount of thing, we will be more averse to losses. We will we will make sure that we do not loss. And our effort to avoid that loss will be much more than as compared to gaining that same amount of money or same amount of the thing. And this has been utilized in a number of sales campaign as well. And if you understood this, you will see most of the advertisements in a very logical way, guys. And this is the fourth category of use case selling. That is emotion. You invoke emotion. That is, you talk about the pathos part of Aristotle theory. And that is, you talk about the loss aversion theory or prospect theory. So overall, we studied about the four important pillars of use case selling. We started with needs, 
then we went into insights, then we talked about conversations and short stories, and then finally we covered emotions. And these are the four pillars of use case selling.